Oh. Welcome back to a special edition of Rock Forever. We've got a very special guest. We call him the Colonel. Please welcome the Rock and Roll Hall of Famer himself, Steve Cropper. All right. I'm here. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to rock forever, aren't we? Oh, my gosh. I know you are, man. I saw you out here with Dave Mason a couple of years ago. Forever is a long way away, the way I yeah, see it. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun. But, you know, I always, I always say no matter what current music you love, you got to know the roots. And when we go back to Stax Records and, and look at those, those songs and that playing, you know, your influence is still felt every day, you know, in today's music. And it's just like early on, you know, falling in love with like Led Zeppelin. The next best thing is to go find out where their sound came from. You know, Willie right. Dixon and John Lee Hooker and, you know, all, all, all the greats, Muddy Waters, you know. So uh, it's, right. it's a real pleasure, Steve. Now, pleasure. tell us a little bit. I know you grew up in kind of the farmland out there in Missouri. What were your <laughs> first impressions? Yeah, I got Every, every summer break, I would get sent back to the farm, by the way. <laughs> tell, tell us about what was the first music that really moved you? What what got you started? Well, the first talk? music that actually moved me uh, was when I moved to Memphis when I was 10 years old. And I heard gospel music for the first time. And before that, I heard a variety of music. And when I've mentioned one, how much is it doggy in the window? It's not, and hey there, what's behind the green door? I guess those kind of records. But when I heard gospel, that turned me around. I had never heard it before, so it was it was new to me. Yeah. Raising a church around gospel music, but not that kind of gospel. It was different, had a different beat to it. And the yeah. thing about the days of stacks, we were very serious about what we did, but we always kept it a lot of fun, and we made dance records. We made records that you could dance to and remember the melodies and that sort of thing. Yeah, jukeboxes were really big back then, right? You oh, go to yeah. any any business and they'd have those dance records you put in your, your, your nickel or whatever it was. And, and all of a sudden the place was alive. It was, we couldn't live without jukeboxes. And I remember breaking, uh, last night by the Marquis and also green onions by Booker T. And uh, I would go with a guy, uh, and he would go see the jukebox operators and he'd drop me off at the radio stations and I'd be checking with the guys on the radio, <laughs> program directors and so forth. Yeah, well, I know uh, Elvis Presley obviously was very moved by gospel music. It, it just, oh, yeah. it just influenced so so much of the music. Now, obviously, as Stacks came together, you know, you and Duck Don and 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 the team are the backing band. You know, with uh, Booker T and MGs, all of a sudden you have all these incredible, you know, black artists: Otis Redding and Sam and Dave and. Carla Thomas, Rufus Thomas, you know, Johnny Taylor. Well, it, was, it was basically the same energy on everybody. The songs were different, but the energy was the same. Yeah, but but little little did a lot of these people know that, you you know, you guys are are, are white. Not that it mattered, but, um, you know. <laughs> it, it, it didn't was, end. It might matter today, but it didn't end at all. <laughs> well, well, you guys well, definitely no had, you guys had a lot to do with it. Just different, different color. Yeah, we you guys had a lot yeah, to do with the integration, you know. Go ahead. I always say there's only two kinds of music. Music that moves you and music that doesn't. Right. Doesn't matter what race or religion or age <laughs> you are. You judge music by whether you like it or not, the same way with people. If you like them, you like them. If you don't like them, you don't like them. And that's the way it is. It should be that way. Absolutely. Never judge a book by its cover. <laughs> well, I, I know to you it was that... It was that Monday through Friday day job. You were clocking in and you were making whatever record was coming up next and whatever singer was. was, was well, I kind of cheated the system a little bit. I got a job. I talked Mrs. Axon and give me a job at the record shop so I could be closer to the studio. <laughs> so one day, the reason, I'm, the reason I was I wound up at Stax is very simple. She went to her brother, Jimmy Stewart, and said, Jim, you're going to start paying Steve. He's spending more time back in the studio than he is in the record shop. <laughs> Wow. So Jim started, they made a deal and Jim started paying me my salary. So, well, you know, look, look, looking at the body of work, I know, like I say at the time, you're just knocking out today's work. But when you look back at that body of work, what, what what's your impression today? <laughs> I don't know if I could do it today. I'd try. <laughs> it was a big job, but I didn't think about it in those days. I was having so much fun. It didn't matter. Yeah, it just it just like I say, it just added up. It, you look in hindsight and like, wow, that's a that's a pretty good catalog. But at the time, you were just 
having fun for the day. Now, yeah, obviously- I'm rattling my brain over a picture I saw this morning of uh, the early MGs playing when Charlie Chalmers, we had a tenor player and, a, and Louis Steinberg was playing bass and we were some prom somewhere. I don't remember the gig, but uh, the picture, they said it was, it came out in 65 and I'm going, Duck Dumb was already with us in 65. So I don't, I don't know what was going on there. And I think that I, I hope that the dates are a little bit off and I hope I'm right and they're wrong. <laughs> so it would better. <laughs> Yeah, well, so so many classics, you know, knock on wood, midnight hour, sitting on yeah, the we, bay. Yeah, we lucky. Just like I said, we, we had a lot of hits, but we were making dance music. And we didn't think about who wrote this or who wrote that. It was, we treat them all the same. It didn't matter. We didn't pay any more attention to something that Eddie Floyd and I might write or Otis and I might write than, than something that Carla might write or somebody else. Isaac and David became great writers. <laughs> You know, the thing about some of those songs, some of those Sam and Dave things that they wrote, we were still there as co-producers on the records, working the same way we always did. It just some of the business part of it changed a little bit, and that's about it. Well, we can't even count how many covers have been done, you know, of this catalog. I have no idea, and you're <laughs> right about that. I, 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 I love, I love the Sammy Hagar. That. Sammy Hagar, who later became the lead singer of Van Halen, he actually did Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, and you played on that cover. He did. <laughs> I saw him recently at a James Burton concert. And uh, when I say recently, I forget what year it was, 2019, I guess. And, and I had not seen Sammy in a long time since I lived in L.A. And he and I worked on a song called, uh, a movie called A Roadie. And uh, I had to remind him of that. And he said, yeah, we did. Didn't we? <laughs> I don't think they used it, but anyway. Yeah, some good work on it. Some good, Great good times, definitely. Now, it, it must have been kind of a, 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 a door opener again when a John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd come calling in the 70s. They, they're hot on Saturday Night Live. And yeah, they- we got a lot, a little bit of flack. No, I say a lot of flack. We probably, it was a lot at the time, but it was a little bit of flack about it. What are you and Doug Dunn doing playing behind a couple of comedians? <laughs> Wait a minute. These guys are actually musicians. They didn't know that. I don't care. Well, that's it. They were having fun. But like you say, this was dance music. So you can be a serious musician and still have fun. There's no question. Exactly. And, and I don't think, uh, and I got calls from people. They knew it was us. And uh, I said, you know, the funny thing about Duck and I, when we played behind the Blues Brothers, we didn't change a thing. We played the same way we did in high school and at Stacks, and it didn't change a thing. And it seemed to work. So, what is we it? It, they were having a good time. But, um, you, you know, <laughs> Dan Aykroyd later. Fun. And Duck always said, We're not going to make work out of, out of this, are we, boys? So, <laughs> sure. Well, Dan Aykroyd was super, super serious. He started the chain of the House of Blues. And of course, John Belushi, rest in peace. You know, he, he had a real passion for music. So, you know, it, it, it's like people want to put you in a box. Like if you're an actor, you can't be a, a musician. And if you're a <laughs> comedian, you can't be a singer. You know, it's we all have multiple talents. So get used uh, to we it. We were very lucky. We, we were able to adapt to live music. That's the good news. And we'd already done it for a while. So we've been doing it uh, for a long time when we got with the Blues Brothers. And we did two world tours with Levon Helm and the RCU All-Stars. And we had also done live shows with Otis and all for the Stacksville Review. Well, yeah, I know that that Blues Brothers album was cut out here live at the uh, Universal Amphitheater before they had a right. roof on it. Nine shows, and I think four of those shows were recorded, of which three were made up the album. There were three shows recorded Amazing. that made up the album. Well, you know, with, it, with, that album to me never did sound live. It sounded like a studio record. It did, the way it, was it did. Put together. Well, the, the, the movie was incredible. You got to bring out James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, uh-huh. John Lee Hooker. That's smart on Dan Aykroyd's part and, and John Landis's part. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what's your best memories of the movie? Boy, there's so many. I have no idea. I mean, it's just, it was a lot of fun making the movie. And Duck and I looked at each other and Duck turned to me and he said, man, I could do this the rest of my life. I said, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finally they had a well, the movie business can be a lot of fun as well i know it's a lot of hard work and and we're not actors we're musicians but uh the lines that uh, Ackroyd wrote for us very simple little quick lines and it didn't matter whether we we're actors or not so yeah well you know they had the budget so they went big time they went and got all the heroes 
a super, yeah. super classic movie, the original Blues Brothers. Now, 92, you got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and you end up up there playing and jamming with the likes of Eric Clapton, George Harrison, Tom Petty, Johnny Cash, Neil Young. What are your best memories of that night getting into the Rock Hall of Fame? Well, you know, there was a picture. They, they, there were some guitar players there that were there to induct people. Others were there because they were being inducted. Somebody got real smart and snapped a picture, grabbed all the, all the guys, went around, and we took a picture together. And B.B. King said that's his favorite picture of all time. So it's, it's behind me, right right here behind me. There's a lot of great musicians in there, great players. Jimmy yeah, Page. That, and that was certainly a special Jeff night. Jack, my Lord. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that was a fun night for everybody. Well, it was, it was certainly an incredible thing. Now, that brings us to Fired Up, the new album, Talk about the idea of making a brand new album here, 2021, what your thoughts were, you know, behind well, this it. and how it all came together. <laughs> Process wise, it's a gamble like anything else. They're either going to love it or they're not going to like it. But I had this inkling suspicion that since all this pandemic, world pandemic and all that, people were ready to rock and roll and dance and have fun. And that's what this record is all about. So I say it's my first real record intentionally since uh, the first record, which came out in uh, 76 or whenever, 77, whenever it came out. And uh, it's intentionally dance music. It's fun. It's, it's just grooving stuff. And hopefully people will be able to listen to it and, and, and remember some of the melodies of it. Well, absolutely. 76, boy, that's like 45 years ago. Now that's talk, that, talk about who you got, that, uh, <laughs> who did you get to collaborate with you? Who played on this? Who helped produce it for you? <laughs> Well, John Tibbon was a co-producer of it, and it's his idea. And uh, a lot of these songs were written for a Cavalier Cropper project that we we're working on. And uh, Cavalier played on a couple of them, and he said, you know, I'm not really interested in, in finishing these songs up. And he said, even if we did, I probably wouldn't want to sing them. So we let it go. I just thought it was a dead issue. I just was putting down some grooves and stuff. And so John Tibbon brought it to my attention. He said, man, I've got all these tracks over here that you and I wrote but they're unfinished. And I said, well, if you want to do something with them, we're going to need a singer. He said, I got one. And then Roger Real is really a great singer. And I said, where's he been all my life? So I didn't know nobody, but I should have, but I didn't. And, you know, being in two different genres of music, I'm more in R and B and he's more in the rock or was, and, and it was great collaboration. And, uh, you know, he, he makes, he, he's got as much, uh, R and B interest and chops as, as I have, I think, and he's really brought these songs to life, so it's pretty cool. Well, that's always what it's about, that creative collaboration, you know, when one plus one can equal three, four, or five. You Whatever know? it does, and I love somebody else complimenting me, not because I've written something, because I come up with an idea, and I said, hey, what do you think about this? They go, yeah, if they don't like it, we go on to the next idea. So, so I've collaborated on about everything. I always do that. So we're talking about the great Felix Cavallari from the Young Rascals? Absolutely. Wow. And we made a pretty good record. We didn't use any of these songs, obviously, but uh, he's playing on a couple of them. We got his permission to use them, and he said, fine, go ahead, use them. So a absolutely. playing on uh, yeah. what, Far Away, and I forget the other one he's playing on. Now tell us, as you look back at this record, tell us if there's any stories about any of your particular songs you're most proud of on this one. Well, uh, stories of songs, I don't know, because a lot of it I had forgotten about. The, the, some of them are very, very old. They're not fresh and brand new. They are new in terms of the fact that I overdubbed on them and, uh, and remixed them and all after Roger, Roger did his thing. And I had told John, I said, I'm not going to do anything with this until I hear the vocals. And so basically I was hearing it for the first song, a lot of them for the first time. And that's the way I like to overdub is hear it for the first time. And uh, when I hear a song, the same thing in the studio for the first time, then I'll put my interest and groove to it and, and we'll go from there. So uh, the stories that I have is, the, is remembering how some of them were written with John and I. And a lot of these songs were just done, most of them were done to a loop that he found or, or recorded or whatever. He has a studio in his house, by the way. So he wasn't affected by the lockdown at all. He, had, he was right there in his own studio. And I think uh, Beth Hooker sang background on one, one of the songs, and all she had to do was walk through the backyard because she's John Tibbins' next door neighbor. 
and I'm about uh, maybe 10 minutes from my house to the RCA studios where mine is, where it was mixed. And I had no problem going down there. I didn't get stopped or anything, so that's fine. Well, the list of the artists you've collaborated with are, are, are truly, absolutely overwhelming. Um, the Rod Stewart's, the Ringo Stars, the Albert Kings. <laughs> I mean, the, the list is just monstrous. Ta even, even John Lennon, I know you played on that rock and roll album. Was that Phil Spector? Did you cut that with Phil? Yeah, we cut that in LA at a, at a and m Studios with Phil producing. That was a crazy time. <laughs> And I think they finished the album up. John finished his album up uh, in New York with the New York musicians. Okay. Well, talk a little bit about Rod Stewart, because I know you've done a number of records with Rod. Well, uh, to tell you the start of that, my good friend Tom Dowd called me. I was living in L.A. at the time. He said, I'm coming out in about three or four days. He said, I'm producing this new artist. And he's got uh, not a new artist on the market. He asked me if I knew who Rod Stewart was, but it was his first time to produce him. I said, no, I really don't. He said, you remember faces? I said, yeah. You talking about Maggie Mae? He said, yeah, that's the singer. He said, he's already in LA. He's rented a house in Beverly Hills. And I want you to go over there tomorrow and take him some songs. And I said, okay, I'll do that. And I did that. And then Tom came out and we wound up doing Tonight's Tonight. Rod and I wound up writing together and we did, uh, I, mine was too much. Uh, the song I presented to Rod was called Too Much Noise. And then he changed the title and some of the words to such Stone Cold Sober. Da 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 da. Well, I'm Stone Cold Sober again. Same message, same basic thing about a guy coming off the road and going home. And there's a party going on. It's too much noise. <laughs> and then his idea was, oh, well, I'm Stone Cold Sober again. I got I got to stop this, you know, messing around and singing and doing all this stuff. And he's just home for a while. Well, those but records are can't get any risk, so they're certainly timeless. How about working with Ringo Starr? Well, you know, the the one thing I remember, I played on a lot of his records, and uh, you know, he did a cover of Sweet Sixteen, and and I played on. I think I'm credited on the album as playing Step Lightly, but uh, we presented a song that John that George Harrison had written, and uh, none of the guys really liked it very much, and uh, so Richard Perry said. Well, we'll cut it another time. We'll just throw this off the session. I looked at Nikki Hopkins. I said, Nikki, let's go and put a groove on this. So every time I see your face, it reminds me of the places we used to go. <laughs> Big hit for Ringo. Oh, so yeah. we've been friends ever since that time. And I, the last time I saw him was uh, in England at an awards thing. And I, we were sitting at a tin top table and, and some guy said, hey, there's a guy behind you raising up. He's trying to get your attention. I turn around this Ringo. <laughs> He and Barbara were over there. And I, I went over there and uh, said hello. I hadn't seen him in a long time, and uh, you know, since LA time, so it'd been a while. Yeah, well, the, the the Beatles certainly shook up uh, America and the world, boy, when they came out. Uh, the things they have done, <clears throat> and I got to work with every one of them except Paul and I are the only ones, only Beatle that I've never actually played on a session or worked with him on. And he's always, we and I have always said, you know, we need to do something together, whether it's write a song or get in the studio, we never did do it. Now I've been around him when he was mixing and uh, I was at uh, Hyder doing something. I forget what I was doing at the time. And somebody came over and said, you know, Paul is next door <laughs> mixing the record. He was doing, listen to what the band said, a man says, what a band on the run. I think band on the run. So I went over there and, it, you know, well, I'd met him before I'd been to, he always invited me to his parties and whatever. So I knew him pretty well, but we had never worked together and we didn't work that day either. I was doing something. He was doing something, but, uh, that's when he was married to, uh, Linda and she was there. And, uh, you know, that I may be the last time I actually saw Paul. I don't remember. Well, the incredible new album, we want everybody to go out and support. It is fired up. You can go to his website. Thank you. Play it, Steve .com. We need more laughing and dancing. I'll tell you <laughs> more excitement and more, you know, everybody's sort of been down in the dumps. And I've been saying before this pandemic, we need more laughter. Nobody was laughing. Everybody's very serious about everything. Well, tell a joke and laugh every now and then. And uh, during this time <laughs> when uh, people were doing the selfies, I was doing some lectures. And I said, if you want to be different and be noticed, wear something silly, wear a silly hat, Wear silly clothes, do something crazy. 
You don't just take a photo and say, look how good I look. So anyway, it is.